welcome to Talk Art. Today we have a panel of Silicon Valley artists. Let's get started by asking them to introduce themselves. Hi, um, my name is Lessa Bouchard. I'm an interdisciplinary artist. I have an MFA in interdisciplinary art and media from Columbia College Chicago. And I'm the founder of Archive Mixed Media, a collaborative storytelling company. We uh, create stories about issues in the community and educate and inspire people to uh, build relationships across generations. And I'm Roxanne Jansen. I'm a photographer uh, specializing mostly in nature and landscape, uh, as well as travel and occasionally other things that I can't resist, like history. <laughs> and I'm Elizabeth Hansen. I'm an acrylic painter, and um, I've done paintings for quite some time now that are inspired by the colors and textures of nature and including the grand cosmos down to, you know, the colors and textures of plants. And um, I have a degree in art from UC Berkeley and also a degree in landscape architecture from Cal Poly. And I'm Katie Morton. I grew up in Palo Alto and received my BFA from the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. And then I moved to Beijing for four years, now back in the Bay Area. I've been working on a series of feminist takes on Greek mythology, all, mostly in oil paint, but also in collage as well. And my uh, solo show, Hand to Hand, will be opening at Strutt's Art Gallery in San Francisco on July 6th. So we've all participated in Silicon Valley Open Studios. Let's talk about that. Tell us about your best conversation with a customer. Do you enjoy talking with customers, or is it challenging for you? I love talking to uh, the people that would come through our studios. Uh, I happen to have a studio at the uh, Coverly Artist Studio Program, and it's located in a community center here in Palo Alto. And so we have the benefit of having a group of us being there. That So all of our different audiences um, really feed each other, you know, so you get there's a diversity of artists in that program. You have sculptors, you have uh, performance artists, you have videographers, you have document, you have this range, printers, uh, painters, a range of disciplines. So you have all of their different audiences coming to see their work at their studios and then, oh, there's like 20 other studios for them to visit. So they, you know, they make the rounds. So for me, SVOS has always been a joy because I get to talk to so many different people for, with so many different perspectives. So there's, there are issues around whether or not I, you know, as with the kind of work that I do, I'm not necessarily selling an object. Uh, it's more performance practice and event-based. Uh, but usually that, that, that opportunity to engage is rewarding for me because that's the kind of work I do is about conversation mm -hmm. so yeah I I have had mixed um, reactions from people and I I find it awkward sometimes to start the conversation with people who come to look at the art I also show in an in a um, area where there are people who come uh, to see the oil painter there or the jewelry artist or others and maybe they haven't come specifically to see my photography or the opposite is sometimes true where they've come specifically to see mine and not the others and so you have people crossing and I find sometimes <coughs> starting the conversation awkward but I have discovered my trick finally for me is I have a coffee cup in my hand <laughs> and then honestly it feels more like a conversation and it's easier for me otherwise I feel like I'm just standing there with nothing in my hands and I'm invading people's spaces or something but with a coffee cup I swear I I've had some of the best conversations with people some of whom know a tremendous amount about art some who know nothing about art but they want to start looking at it so yeah I've had I feel awkward at the beginning, but I think I've got it now. <laughs> the coffee cup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I've held the, the open studios at both my home, where it was just me and my art, 
um, I think the advantage there was that I got to show a much greater range and a much mm -hmm. broader number of pieces. Um, but this last year I did it at the gallery house and there were um, eight of us who participated. Um, and a much nicer space for using much bigger pieces. Mm -hmm. And so that really worked for me. Um, but I think conversation in both places is pretty easy for me. I mean, I love to talk about art. So for me, it's, uh, it is a matter of getting um, some sense pretty quickly about where a particular viewer might be coming from to know where to start engaging them. And um, I think just open-ended questions for me are just the easiest way to, you know, what do you see in the painting or, you know, do you do you have a favorite here among these or you know just some open-ended kind of thing that usually introduces uh, you know some dialogue that can happen but the most interesting conversations for me as a person are um, as an artist are the ones with uh, people who do actually have a fairly deep interest in art <laughs> because I just I find that for me to you know there's one thing about educating and bringing people along who don't have much of a background, but for expanding me as a person and, and, and as an artist, I feel like that talking to uh, people who really have either a history of doing it themselves or a history of curating or whatever, you know, that they, um, that they can just, the conversation can become, become much more give and take. And so I enjoy that. That's interesting because I, I find that um, I sometimes have the opposite. Where, where someone walks up and they're seeing something that they've basically never seen before and they're excited by it, you know, and so I, I find that fun. As well as listening to someone who really understands art and can, and can see the things that I am hoping that they'll see. <laughs> I have a How similar experience yeah. as well. Yeah, because I feel like some of the time, you right, you have other artists coming through, some of the time you have people looking to buy art and it's interesting, I try to use it actually as an opportunity to learn about my art, that I often find mm -hmm. that people see things in it that I never saw or I didn't realize that I was expressing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always excited to go back to making art after open studios mm -hmm. because I've learned about what, what the effect of my work is on mm -hmm. other people. And I feel it's also interesting what you put into the world when you talk about it. I had a painting and this couple was very interested in buying it, but I, so I told the story behind it. They were saying, oh, well, what is it about? And I explained the whole thing. And the, they had both loved it. By the end, the husband said, I love it because it's so dark. And the wife said, I don't love it as much because it's so dark. But yeah. it's interesting how much, right, both the backstory and the painting itself can come together to form a narrative. Right. So um, what type of location is best for you? Do you like to show on your own or with friends? I know that we've talked a little bit about doing it in your own space as well as a group space, but what's best for sales and does that affect your preference? It's a great question. I think that there are a number of different um, experiences depending on the kind of work you do. For me, I've had a couple of really great interactions that have generated shows from SVOS encounters um, just by virtue of being a part of that community um, I, but because I don't sell objects as much or ha don't have a, a, that's not as large a part of my practice it's a little bit more of a social practice kind of um, it's uh, yeah it's, it's that's an interesting question I think because a lot of what I do is much more rooted in, in grants, you know, writing grants and applications and RFPs and, you know, so it's a little bit of a balancing act, I think. Um, I've definitely, you know, some years kind of considered whether or not that that's, you know, whether it's the best financial model for me, but I think that it's, it's part of the question about building a community and being part mm -hmm. of the conversation that if you really do believe that art as dialogue, that SVOS is a part of that. It's, uh, you know, at the core for, you know, since I live here, that's my community. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
I like showing with other people. I feed off the energy and I feed off the um, camaraderie. Uh, I also know that the other artists are aware of what I'm doing and I'm aware of what they're doing and it kind of helps you bring your A-game, you know, when you know that other people are watching and listening. And it, it helps me come up with new ideas when I hear other people. And, and it helps when you hear someone, um, uh, a visitor there, walk through and you can hear the kinds of questions that they're asking the other artist. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of, sometimes if they've started with someone else first, you have a feel for whether this person um, is just wandering down the street and didn't know that anything was going to be there that day and they wandered in by chance, or whether there's someone who sought out, who seeks out art all the time. And it kind of helps guide the conversation. But I will say that there are times when I, you know, just don't have the energy that day. And the concept of selling online through a third party, which I also do under a different name, uh, sometimes, sometimes that's wonderful, you know. So when you don't have the energy for a show or what have you, things are still happening. It's nice to know they're still happening. <laughs> that is nice. That's comforting. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I referred to this in my first uh, sort of discussion, but um, I, I ended up preferring, out of just the two years now that I've done it, I ended up preferring uh, showing at the gallery. And it is partly because um, uh, in just the uh, sitting there for the day and greeting all the different people that came in, that you did get to interact with the other artists who were there, who mm -hmm. were also showing, and it really is the kind of uh, quality time, I would say, that you don't normally get when you're in a community, an arts community, and people are sort of uh, ships passing in the night. So uh, I think that I got a much more in-depth uh, understanding of the other people's art. Um, I think for me the question of sales and SVOS is still an open one since it hasn't happened for me at either one. Um, and it, it seems, when you go into it, I think that might seem like a really important part of the equation. But I think once you've uh, participated in it uh, a couple of times, it really becomes clear to me that it's more like Wes has said. It's, it's, you are part of the art community, and this is part of what the art community does, and this is part of what the, um, the peninsula, in our case, um, comes together once a year to give brand new people an opportunity to just come out and uh, you know, present their work and have it seen by the public. And then other people who have developed clientele over the year to continue to show. So mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's a totally valuable thing apart from the question of sales, you know, I guess is what my point is. When for me, it's actually a little bit the opposite that I've ha shown in a couple different studio environments for open studios. Mm -hmm. And the one that actually I had most sales at, the other artists around me were selling similar work, not necessarily content-wise, but it was also oil painting. Mm -hmm. And it was also on a large, um, you know, medium-sized scale. So anyone who came there was coming to specifically buy that kind Look of art. That kind and of so of that art. surrounding yeah. myself by, you know, with other artists like me, it actually allowed for a particular community to come and seek that out. So, and that was a, mm -hmm. it was a new experience for me with SVOS. Mm -hmm. So, we all live in a very tech-oriented valley. Understatement, very tech-oriented. Give us your thoughts on being an artist in Silicon Valley. Is it more challenging, do you think, compared to being in other places? And if so, in what way? And how do you cope with that? I think it's incredibly challenging. You know, being an interdisciplinary artist coming to an area that spawned Adobe, um, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. You know, it's, it's incredibly intellectually stimulating and sometimes a little bit overwhelming. Uh, there's, you know, a bit of a, sometimes there's a concern that there's a bias towards, towards tech that can feel alienating, but I really do think in uh, having lived here for some time, some time now and doing quite a bit of interviewing and researching into the, the history, into that history in my work. I think that uh, there's the benefit of the international influence mm -hmm. uh, that 
many of the people who are part of that techni technical community um, are coming from all over the world and have incredible art backgrounds themselves often. So uh, there's a really great, for me, it's been an, um, an incredibly profound and uh, enriching experience. It's really fed my practice as an artist in some ways maybe too much but <laughs> <laughs> yeah you're a little overwhelming i'm, I'm very mm. curious to know what that yeah means. no i mean it's it's because it can be overwhelming mm -hmm. so it's that kind of like okay so what do you do after enlightenment uh, so like are you being enlightened or are you just being flattened it's mm -hmm. it's it's intense there's a lot coming at you from all these different sources from all over the world that are kind of coalescing here to figure out how we deal with communicating, how we're going to communicate is, you know, what's acceptable? What is reality? How do we decide what's reality? Who gets to decide what's reality? Who's making that reality? Who's coding that reality? Who gets to contribute to that conversation? Who can show up to a Media X conference at Stanford at 4 o'clock in the afternoon to have that conversation? That makes a lot of sense. For me, it's been kind of a mixed bag being in Silicon Valley and trying to do art. I've, I've worked in high tech before. I worked in aerospace. Uh, I've worked in publications. I've worked in a lot of different things. And I, I understand the mentality, but I do think that um, certain other places have more of a history of appreciating and investing in art. And here, I think, uh, not as many people invest in art. Not as many people are interested in buying it, having it on their wall, and thinking long term about art. And also, I think a lot of people feel that, um, particularly with photography, that they get a little more caught up in the, the specs of the piece than you might find in another area. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's true. Everywhere, I think, people will ask what, you know, what lens did you use, what, you know, what aperture did you have that at. Uh, but here sometimes people are more focused on that than they are on the resulting image. And sometimes people feel that, you know, if I just had that kind of camera, I could create that. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand or see the art aspect of it. And so that's been frustrating. And as you mentioned, some of the, the software play, uh, companies some of the biggest ones that deal with um, art and graphics and such are here. And many times people feel that that makes them an expert in imaging. I don't know. It, it's, it's interesting to see the different reactions of people as they're looking at it and they hear the conversations. On the other hand, there's a lot of people here from different countries, different parts of the world, and they're more accepting of new people and new ideas than they are in, in other places. And so if you start in a non-traditional way, I think you're more likely to get a foothold here. Whereas in some other markets, some other areas, you might not be able to get a start if you hadn't started in the traditional correct way. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I have a little bit of a different first set of issues, I agree with everything that you both said, but I also think that it's just, it's very hard for what I would consider the sort of more traditional um, making arts um, group of people that uh, I consider myself part of. And I think if you're an oil painter and you know, a photographer, that that's what you're doing. You're making an object by hand. And, and I think that, first of all, there's no studio space here. I mean, try to find a studio space that you can afford, right? It's just, I mean, people can't even find houses, let alone an extra garage somewhere <laughs> to throw your stuff together. Um, and also, there's, there's a, very, a, a real lack. I would say we have co-op. Uh, artist galleries and that, and then we have a small handful of very high-end blue, blue chip galleries. We have a complete dearth of <laughs> all the kinds of gallery spaces that can fill the middle there that you do find still 
in San Francisco and in the East Bay. There are other communities. So I think that one of the things that's happened here is that there is, there is so much focus. There's tremendous creativity here in the Tech Valley. I mean, and so, you know, it's not for me to take away from anything about their creative, their artists, and they're working in tech, and they're making GIFs and, you know, whatever software. Um, and that's all art, as far as I'm concerned. It's still art, and it's making things, and it's Great creativity. Um, but for people who are, you know, need a studio <laughs> and want to make something and have a place to show it that isn't just going to be sold under some licensing agreement out, you know, through technology, it's, it's not the easiest community. I don't find that it's the easiest community. So. For me, I feel very lucky in that I grew up in the Bay Area. And I have to say, growing up in the Bay Area made it much easier, I think, compared to some other communities to pursue the arts that my parents were supportive of my choice. Um, they wanted me to keep my, 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 all of my options open, but that once I said I was going to go to art school, they, support, you know, they supported me emotionally. Um, and that was really important. And then I you know, found other ways to go and find art adventures and ways to survive as an artist. So you're right, yeah, it is, it is hard to survive as an artist in the Bay Area. But at the same time, it's a community that Silicon Valley really values museums that being in an area where people talk about art, talk about museums, that was important to me and Stanford's right here with their art museum. So tell me about one exciting adventure you've had as an artist. <laughs> oh, um, an exciting adventure as an artist. Oh, I or think. Or what excites you as an yeah, artist, that's fine that's too. A, that's, a, that's a great question, actually. <clears throat> I was just thinking about, uh, th there's this, a uh, body of work that I've been uh, developing over the last five, year, five, eight, eight, five years, really. I mean, it's since since moving to this area, actually exploring our relationship with books and digital technology and how that's been changing, and uh, having been a bookseller off and on all my life, and also um, you know working, moving into Silicon Valley, and um, uh, yeah, um, I was part of a group that we developed a play about uh, books and all of that. And there were book sprites and archivists, mm -hmm. and it was a little abstract and absurdist and fun. And uh, after we finished the play, I kept doing research around the subject of what we hold on to and let go of. And I um, went to the um, College Art Association conference when it was in DC a couple of years ago and ended up going to the Library of Congress and ended up getting an interview with Thomas Mann who is the author of the Oxford Guide to Library Research who happened to be a retired reference librarian at the Library of Congress who still volunteers there. So I was able to get an interview with him and you know could talk to him about his perspective on the analog versus the digital, That's which amazing. was, it was That's magical. Incredible. It was, I just have chills. The whole, <laughs> I just, I ended up spending that entire conference that I was supposed to be over talking to the NEA, who would send me to the NEH, who would send me to the, NEH. <laughs> anyway, so I just went to the Library of Congress <laughs> the whole time, and it was blissful. That so, amazing. yeah, that was, so that's my favorite adventure. I've had so many. It's so <laughs> it, it's really it's difficult to to pin it down because honestly a couple of times it's just been a conversation that I've had with someone that is so exciting to me that I wouldn't have had otherwise if if there weren't the photography to kick it off. But there've also been things like uh you know driving I had to happen to have a telephoto lens on my camera at the time and I was trying to get shots of um smoke jumpers in their aircraft and as I was standing there and I was outside the smoke jumper school one of the guys came out and says that's a nice camera and I said yeah and he goes come on in and so I got a tour around of the aircraft and uh, you know talked to all the guys at smoke jumper school and uh, that was a lot of fun for me you just it's there's so many times where you get to see and do things that you wouldn't otherwise do and the difficult thing is trying to turn that into a project. 
mm. right? Because some sometimes I get to see and do things uh, with the understanding that, well, you can't take a picture of that, and you can't do this one, and you can't do that one. Um, but come on in. It's like, it's fantastic, it's wonderful, but, you know, it's difficult to put together a project when you're limited on what you can do. But anyway, those are just a couple of the ones that I've really enjoyed. That's amazing. Um, I think one of the more interesting passages for me was going as an art student from Berkeley to live in Manhattan for two years in the mid-70s. So that must have been fun. Yeah, and, <laughs> and it was, um, the my husband and I were um, involved in the arts there, and he had a job at a uh, Tibetan and Nepalese gallery, um, and I worked at a print gallery, but basically I went around looking at art and painting all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was uh, an experience of, well, this is the big time, the big city, this is, these are sort of the aesthetic standards to which many places adhere. And it was an interesting education, it was an adjunct to my sort of academic education that I, um, that I really appreciated. But also, those paintings that I was working on at that time were um, an attempt to capture white light, which was a real technical and sort of philosophical challenge that, um, that I found really exciting. That's, yeah, that's wonderful. For me, I would have to say that I, living in Beijing for four years, that art really affords you the ability to travel and that flexibility. Yes. And so it's hard to, you know, boil four years down to anything, you know, anything so small. But it was probably the best experience of my life. And I hope that I will have the opportunity to do that again. Mm -hmm. but thank so you. So you did work there? In, you, mm -hmm. in I, tr I actually yeah. moved there right after I finished my undergrad. Mm -hmm. I had been teaching glass blowing, and I continued to teach glassing for one more year. And then I just up and moved <laughs> and fell in. I, moved after I visited for one week and I'd never felt the way I'd felt there. And I, when I was there, I felt like I finally understood myself and that I could be myself. And actually a lot of it, it wasn't about looking to the outside, it was about looking to the inside. So thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for watching Talk Art.